just before I give my lecture, there was a patient in Medwin Hospitals when I was working there. Uh, my patient was admitted for a neurological problem, seen by a dermatologist because of an associated dermatological problem. Then he wrote me a referral saying, your patient is admitted, please uh, evaluate him. And he was taking 45 drugs. He was taking 45 drugs. The dermatologist requested me, can you please reduce his drugs? Out of 45, my prescription was only 8 drugs. With great difficulty, I reduced them by 3, so made it 5 drugs out of 8 cardiovascular drugs. But still the total count was 45 to 42. After 3 days when I went back, the number was 48. The dermatologist has added the rest of them. So I think you need to keep them simple. At the same time, every time the patient visits, you need to reevaluate and see which drug is required further. Quite often I find that 30% uh, of the drugs which we may have used uh, say six months back may no longer be required. So that is uh, one of the fundamental steps wherein you need to really look into prescription every time the patient comes back to you for a follow-up. I am sorry it had to be the last lecture of today, uh, but as physicians, there is a very important message. I think I would emphasize on the message rather than the lecture. The message is that uh, as uh, internists, as specialists, you and us, we need to look at the patient, the entire patient, as one organ, rather than as a heart patient or a brain neurology patient or a liver patient, so on and so forth. As students, you might remember uh, that you always, before the examinations, you would go into the medical wards and ask the medical registrar, I want to see some heart case, some liver case, some brain case, you know, kind of thing. Uh, that you carry on through your further career and get confused about it. So it is important to realize the message that uh, the heart diseases have systemic manifestations quite frequently and present with systemic manifestation. And the reverse also is true. A systemic disease may in fact present only with cardiac manifestation. So uh, you need to keep that concept in mind that patient is one whole organ. So there is a though for convenience, for efficiency, we have specialties and subspecialties and sub sub specialities. Ultimately, it should not uh, mean that a, every patient has only one single problem. Generally, they do have multiple problems, and in current times, as the population is growing older and older, uh, now anybody who is above 55, 60 years never has single and only one medical problem. They always have three or more than three medical problems. Having said that, that ultimately leads to confusion if you don't realize it. Leads to polypharmacy where there are drug interactions and incorrect uh, I mean, um, intake of the drugs and then so on and so forth. I will just give you some illustrations. And before that, I would like you to know what are all the common systemic disease which could present with a, a dominant cardiac manifestation? It could be an infection, any kind of infection might present with, you heard the lecture of uh, myocarditis by Dr. Padmanabhan. So here you also need to realize sepsis anywhere can present with a myocardial depression and a heart failure. In fact, that may be the cause of the final death. The metabolic problem I was mentioning about hypocalcemia, I was mentioning about vitamin B1 deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, the nutritional factors, endocrinal. You have diabetic cardiomyopathy, you have acromegaly cardiomyopathy, you have thyrocardiacs, you have parathyroid disease, you have a pheochromocytoma manifesting as a cardiomyopathy. You have uh, one important group which was not talked about till say six, seven years back uh, when uh, we published a large series of inflammatory and uh, uh, infiltrative granulomatous myocardial disease. This article was published 
in uh, Journal of American College of Cardiology about five to six years back by Dr. Narsimhan and our group. And uh, degenerative diseases, and you have malignancy. Malignancy has a close association with heart disease. It could be a secondary in the heart, it could be a primary tumor of the heart, but beyond malignancy of the heart, it is connected with the oncology department in many ways. One is that chemocardiotoxicity, those who receive chemotherapy may end up with myocardial failure and quite frequently that is irreversible myocardial failure. They may go on to probably needing even cardiac transplantation in addition to very aggressive uh, drug therapy which may include uh, all kinds of therapies which we use in heart failure. You heard it from Dr. Krishna Mohan earlier. And radiation, radiation heart disease also goes unrecognized. The reason being the radiation effects on the heart may not be felt immediately. It may come one year later, five years later, even 20 years later. So you have radiation pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis, radiation myocardial problems, endocardial problems, radiation valve disease, mitral stenosis, aortic valve disease, radiation coronary arthritis and acute death on the radiation table because of acute radiation coronary arthritis. So all these are possible. So hence the big oncology centers have cardiology department. They call it as oncocardiology oncocardiology department manned by cardiologists specially trained in cardiac problems in patients with malignancies. And you have hematological problems which present with cardiac manifestations like for example uh, uh, thalassemia, sickle cells, so on and so forth and coagulopathies, hypercoagulable state may present with intracardiac thrombi, coronary artery disease, acute myocardial infarction, DVT, pulmonary embolism, so on and so forth, collagen disorders, neuromuscular dystrophies and a new group of conditions what are called as a toxic valvulopathies. So ergot derivatives which use anorectic drugs which we use and Parkinsonian drugs, anti-Parkinsonian drugs, they can lead to valvular heart disease. It's a new group of valvular disease which may be produced by the drugs. So they are called as toxic valvulopathies. Then you have another group of I mean, diseases which may present with significant heart problem. Uh, topping the list is chronic renal failure. Chronic renal failure and heart disease are very, very closely linked. We have done a lot of work on this linkage between uh, CKD and heart disease. So this goes by the name of cardiorenal syndrome. You have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4. I don't want to go into the details. It's possible you may have heard about it in the morning when Dr. Chakravarti was speaking about these relations. And remember that one of the causes, in fact, the commonest cause of death in CKD patient is not renal failure, it is cardiovascular disease. So it is very important to rule out a cardiovascular disease in anybody who has a chronic kidney disease when they come to you first or when they go for dialysis or when they go for transplant or when they come back for follow-ups over a period of time. Then you have antiphospholipid antibody syndromes and then cirrhotic liver disease can present as a cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. I will show you one example. They may also come with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Then you have the Paget's disease which is not a common problem for us. But they can also present with a heart disease, obesity, heart disease and so on and so forth. So these are all the metabolic disorders as you can read uh, which can present dominantly with a cardiac problem. So echo in systemic diseases is very important for the diagnosis. It may be the first clue to a systemic disease and it might explain the symptoms. It might also be a prognostic indicator. This is one of the patients, a 24 years male who came to us with multiple syncopes on exertion, normal vitals, on cardiovascular examination, we found a section systolic mama left parasternal border. During the hospital admission, he had an acute leg ischemia due to an embolism into the femoral artery. 
Before he came to us, he was seen in Vijayawada by a cardiology group. They made a diagnosis of uh, left ventricular myxoma. Then he came to us for surgery. I want you to look at the echocardiogram. This is the mass, which they thought was myxoma, but it wasn't. It wasn't. A, it is a mass, all right, but it is not myxoma. I will tell you what it is. This is in the left ventricular outflow, just below the aortic valve, and this was the cause of his syncopes. This is a transesophageal echo, which is showing the mass better than the transthoracic mass. So finally, when we were uh, investigating him, we found that he had a leukocytosis with the snowfields which were very high, 55%, and then absolute eosinophil count was very high, and degranulated rogue eosinophils were also very high. So this was a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So hyper eosinophilic syndrome, to be categorized as such, must have absolute eosinophil count more than 2,000, and must be consistently present over at least three counts over a period of, over a duration of six months or more than six months. And there should be no other explanation for the eosinophilia, like uh, say parasites, so on and so forth. Then it is called a hyper eosinophilic syndrome. I would like you to remember hyper eosinophilic syndrome is a hypercoagulable state. So they may present with DVT, they may present with cerebrovascular strokes, they may present with intracardiac masses, thrombi, they may present with endomyocardial fibrosis, they may present with coronary arthritis and uh, acute myocardial infarction, they may present with paradoxical embolism, so on and so forth. I don't want to go into so many details, but it is enough to know that a hyper syndrome may in fact be the etiology for so much of cardiovascular and systemic vascular and cerebrovascular manifestation. This patient had a LVOT gradient of more than 100 on Doppler echocardiography. He was operated, this was an intraoperative picture, you can see the mask here. A histopathology was done, so it had shown RBC and the snowfields and lot of fibrous tissue. So another example of a 28 years male, he came to us with multiple hemiplegias, multiple TAAs, and uh, he came to us, his vitals are okay. He had no pulses in the left brachial, left radial, left femoral, left dorsalis pedis or the right dorsalis pedis. Cardiovascular clinical examination did not show anything. Then uh, transthoracic echo, the physician I mean, thought that there was some mass which was not well defined, so he asked us to repeat. So when we repeated, we found that there were masses in the left atrium, which were mobile. Then when we looked at, there is a mass in the right atrium as well. Both of them are connected through the foramen ovale. This is a thrombus embolizing in transit. This was a thrombus which came from the vein trying to cross the foramen ovale and embolize into the systemic circulation, the so-called paradoxical embolism. And this is the thrombus in transit. So it broke off into multiple pieces. Some of them went into systemic circulation. Some of them are still seen in the left atrium and the left atrial appendix. So, uh, this uh, patient made a good recovery of the left hemiplegia, but he continued to have a speech deficit and after the treatment all his peripheral pulses reappeared and uh, when we started investigating him, his C-reactive protein was positive, his homocysteine was very high, the cutoff level is 15, he had about 25 and he had anti-cardiolipin antibodies which were abnormally high. And the final diagnosis was hyperhomocystinemia with anti-cardiolipin antibody syndrome with recurrent systemic embolism. And he also had pulmonary embolism, which I had not shown here, but he had a thrombus which was seen in the right pulmonary artery and main pulmonary artery. And he had a PFO, patent for I mean ovale, with paradoxical embolism with the thrombus in transit. And we treated him with heparin, and this is after treatment. You can see now 
that there is no evidence of any uh, mass across the intraatrial. This is the intraatrial septum, right atrium, left atrium. There is no mass there now. We lost, we lost him for follow-up. We don't know what has happened after discharge, but he was okay at the time of discharge. 55 years male who came with palpitation and shortness of breath to us. Look at the echocardiography. This is a patient with thyrotoxicosis who came to us and he had a murmur over the left lower parasternal border. And then on echocardiography, we found a significant uh, tricuspid regurgitation. This is a tricuspid regurgitation. Right ventricle, right atrium, more than three plus tricuspid regurgitation. This tricuspid regurgitation disappeared after treatment of the thyrotoxicosis. The message out of this case is thyroid has a very close link with uh, cardiac disorders. Hyperthyroidism can produce arrhythmias, it can also produce cardiomyopathy, it can also produce isolated tricuspid regurgitation, it can also produce pulmonary arterial hypertension. This patient had a pulmonary arterial hypertension with tricuspid regurgitation and after therapy disappeared. This is one of those reversible pulmonary arterial hypertensions. Mind you, even hypothyroidism, hypo, hypo also can produce pulmonary arterial hypertension. It can also produce cardiomyopathy and it can produce atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries, pericardial effusion, so on and so forth. So when you find an isolated tricuspid regurgitation in adult and unexplained pulmonary arterial hypertension, please do keep in mind thyroid. Um, in the morning, I, I heard uh, a question, I think you were asking about sarcoidosis. We have a big group of sarcoidosis. We have uh, close to 70 patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. Out of that, we could prove about 34, which was published. Say car cardiac sarcoidosis, I don't want to go into the details for lack of time, is a non caseating granulomatous disease. But please do remember, sarcoidosis is very frequently associated with involvement of the heart. It has a very typical classical involvement of the heart, that is the myocardium. It might present to us like cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy. It might present to us as atrioventricular conduction abnormality, first degree AV block or even complete heart block. It might present to us with tachyarrhythmias, ventricular tachycardia or electrical storm. So that is how they might come to us. So unless you suspect and keep that in mind, you may never be able to make this diagnosis. I remember as a student we were taught, as a teacher I taught that sarcoidosis does not exist in India. But now we know that it does exist. In fact, not only it exists, but it is uh, not infrequent. So you need to keep that in mind. It could be cardiac sarcoidosis. I will show you an example or two when you can suspect that it might be a cardiac sarcoidosis. This slide was borrowed from Mayo Clinic. This is not ours. This uh, patient has uh, attended the Mayo Clinic with uh, shortness of breath and cough and is presented like a dilated cardiomyopathy. So the initial diagnosis was cardiomyopathy. When they started investigating, then they found this was a cardiac sarcoidosis. This is our example, 37 years male. He came to us with recurrent episodes of palpitation, giddiness, near syncope, normal blood pressure, and auscultation and palpation of the heart was normal and he had a ventricular tachycardia documented in the hospital while he was in the hospital and he had a repeated episodes of ventricular tachycardia. Naturally, you know, we thought it is a coronary artery disease, we did a coronary angiogram, this was normal. Then we, our, uh, our cardiologist, staff cardiologist started suspecting maybe this is cardi I mean, cardiac sarcoidosis. So we started investigating, then we did an MRI, then we subsequently found it to be a cardiac sarcoidosis. We did a thoracoscopic mediastinal lymph node biopsy, then subsequently had a ICD. That's a defibrillator was implanted 
in March 2008. So this is uh, uh, the same patient's echocardiogram, which you can see. But remember, uh, it may just echocardiographically, there are no clues, really no clues to think that this is cardiac sarcoidosis, except that you might find anterobasal septum, which is hyperechogenic. Because the sarcoidosis scarring of the myocardium is most frequently and commonly seen in the anterobasal septum. So if you find hyperechogenicity in that location with atrioventricular conduction disorder and or a tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia, even if it is presenting as a dilated cardiomyopathy, particularly with normal coronary angiogram, please do keep in mind it may be a cardiac sarcoidosis. So that is an indication when you should go ahead and do an MRI. MRI is a very good technique. Ravi was talking about it a little while back. And then PET, positron emission tomography is another excellent technique by which you can show the active sarcoid inflammation in the myocardium, active sarcoid inflammation in the lymph nodes, and also you can do a thoracoscopic biopsy of the lymph nodes, which can give you histological clues to, you can see the uh, catheter here across the right atrium and uh, right ventricle, because this patient was on a pacemaker, he came with arrhythmias. This is uh, uh, the same patient, his echocardiogram showed a dilated right ventricle and RV dysfunction. And uh, we did a cardiac MRI. Then we found that there is a mid myocardial scar. Mid myocardial scar. I will show you a typical scar a little later on. This is a third patient, 35 years male. He came with again palpitations and pre syncope. He had a slow VT. On medical treatment, he had a recurrent VT. Then cardiovascular physical examination was normal. His echocardiogram had shown what was compatible with dilated cardiomyopathy with mild myocardial dysfunction. And he had a ablation and an ICD implantation subsequently. So he also presented like a, a dilated cardiomyopathy. So uh, he had an MRI study which showed a patchy mid myocardial scar, but he did not have a classical uh, sarcoid scar in the anterobasal septum, which I will show you a little later. So these are the various types of scar which Ravi had shown a little while back. See, ischemic scars are almost always subendocardial or transmural. They're rarely ever isolated mid myocardial. They rarely ever only sub-epicardial. They are always sub-endocardial or transmural. That is an important thing to be remembered. So any other type of scar, you need to be very careful uh, and get alerted that it is not ischemic heart disease. It may be myocarditis if it is all over and patchy. If it is anterobasal scar, it is sarcoid. If the scarring is inferior, left ventricular, inferior and apical, it is very, very typical for Fabry's disease. I will show you an example. This is a sarcoid scar I wanted you to see. This is the anterobasal septum. Can you see it? There is an arrow here. Anterobasal septal scar. This is the uh, I mean, a, a near pathognomonic scar for sarcoidosis in a given clinical setting. So you should never miss it. This is a late gadolinium enhancement of the myocardium. Then Fabry's disease is a X-linked recessive lysosomal storage disease. I will not go into uh, details of this particular disease because it is not very common. But why we are interested is for two reasons. One, it may be mistaken for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. On echocardiography, it might just look like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a fairly common cardiac condition. So you need to really differentiate them. Why you need to differentiate them is this is curable with drugs. Picked up early, 
treated well, it is curable. And you know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is treatable but not curable. Though the therapy is very expensive, it costs nearly 50 lakh rupees per annum to treat this patient because you have to replace that alpha galactosidase enzyme regularly. This is very very expensive to treat. We have had six patients out of that one patient is on this therapy and this is a lifelong therapy and it is expensive as on today. So this is an echocardiogram of this patient. Uh, initially this was thought to be a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So when we started investigating then uh, we found that this indeed was a, this is the MRI of this patient. You can look at the myocardium here, this is the ventricular septum, myocardium here. When you look at that, you know there is a hypertrophy of the myocardium. So if you just give me this image, I wouldn't be able to tell you whether this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or fibrous disease. If I have to err, I would err saying it is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because it is far more common than Fabry's disease. But you should have that question in mind, this may be Fabry's. Because Fabry's is curable, you must look for that. How do you make that diagnosis? So this is the, this is another patient with Fabry's. Look at this hyperechogenicity of the septum. This is because of the fibrosis. There are two ways by which you can make out. An echocardiogram, there is a very interesting sign which is present, but this is not always present. You have a corridor here, echolucent corridor in the ventricular septum. That is because of the mode of deposition of this uh, lysosomal deposition of this chemical. You have a corridor like echolucent structure. This is very typical for Fabry's disease. But uh, that is not always present. What is more frequently present is an abnormal distribution of gadolinium, the late enhancement of the gadolinium in the myocardium. That is, any scar will take up gadolinium, but here there is a very specific distribution. Look at here, inferior, inferior and a little bit of lateral, inferior and lateral. Sometimes it might be there in the apical. So this distribution of the scar pattern is very typical for Fabry's disease. Keep that in mind. Uh, this is the pathology of the Fabry's. I won't uh, go into the detail. These are all lipid globules, fat globules in the myocardium. Uh, you are asking about hemochromatosis. We have seen hemochromatosis only once, but uh, some of my colleagues, pediatric cardiology colleagues, are following up a group of 60 thalassemia children who are on regular blood transfusion. So once in three or six months they take a portable echo and study their uh, echocardiography for hemochromatosis of the heart. But so far I have seen only one. But this is more commonly found in those patients where they get repeated blood transfusions like thalassemia. So they may present with heart failure. They may present like dilated cardiomyopathy. More often they may present as a restrictive cardiomyopathy. So whenever you make a diagnosis of restrictive cardiomyopathy or whenever you see a patient with cardiac enlargement or uh, dilated chambers or dilated cardiomyopathy physiology and echo in uh, patients with multiple blood transfusions over a period of time, always keep in mind this might be a cardiac hemochromatosis. And Ravi will tell you the other day he was discussing with me uh, one of the investigations which is absolutely typical, absolutely I um, mean giving away diagnosis is MRI. There is nothing like MRI to give you a diagnosis of cardiac hemochromatosis. When you look at the echo, this also was borrowed from Mayo Clinic, this is not our patient. So one of my friend in Mayo Clinic is a cardiologist. He kindly, uh, I mean, courtesy Dr. Biza, he gave this to me. Uh, 
So this is a classical dilated cardiomyopathy on echocardiography. There is no way I would have made a diagnosis of hemochromatosis. But look at this uh, MRI. So you can actually measure the iron load of the myocardium by various techniques on MRI. So these patients also may be given a, uh, I mean, chelating agents so that this iron overload can be reduced, their uh, cardiac function may improve. So the thing to be remembered is when to suspect it and then how to confirm the diagnosis. Confirmation is by MRI. I just have another three, four patients which might interest you. Do you think you would like to hear or I close? 58 years lady, she's the wife of uh, one of my doctor friends in Hyderabad. She had a fibrosarcoma of the pelvis. So she had a surgery, she had radiation therapy, she had chemotherapy years back. Uh, she also, uh, now this uh, lymphoma is not correct, she had a fibrosarcoma. She had a pelvic radiation and she had four chemo cycles. And years later, four or five years later, she came with heart failure. When an echocardiogram was done, we found that she had dilated cardiomyopathy. So when we went back into the history, she had four chemocycles. In fact, they stopped giving the fifth chemocycle because they found that there was echocardiographic myocardial dysfunction, so they stopped it. But one thing to be remembered is, if myocardium is damaged by the chemos, it does not reverse. Even if you stop the drugs, it does not reverse. It rarely ever reverses. It either stops from progressing, or more often, it becomes worse over a period of time. Some of them become so bad, it becomes end-stage heart failure, requiring LVADs are requiring heart transplants. So this lady, of course, is much, much better with uh, chemotherapy for heart failure. She is on digitalis, she is on diuretics, beta blockers, and EAC inhibitors. She is doing much better on medical therapy for the last six years or so. Uh, she hasn't had further problems, but echocardiogram has not improved. She continues to have an ejection fraction of 30% and BNP is more than 1800 or so. 50 years male came to us with shortness of breath and isolated right ventricular congestive heart failure of one year. This is a patient with carcinoid heart disease. So remember, carcinoid is not a common disease, I do understand, but I am showing it uh, because uh, it is so classical when you look at the echocardiogram. Uh, the, it's a very classical finding and pathognomonic. Look at the tricuspid valve. This is what I want you to see. The tricuspid valve is so typical in carcinoid. It is open and fixed. It neither opens further nor closes. It is uh, partially open and partially closed and fixed. And there is a low velocity tricuspid regurgitation which is severe. So in a patient with that kind of tricuspid valve on echo, you must suspect carcinoid disease. So we did his 24 hours urinary I mean, uh, levels which were very high, hydroxy indole acetic acid levels which were very high, but we couldn't treat him. This is a patient whom I saw 20 years back uh, in Usmania hospital. So we couldn't treat him, do anything except giving some decongestive therapy. Uh, this is a patient from Mayo Clinic again, presented with multiple uh, spells of impending stroke. And he had a history of DVT and pulmonary embolism. So look at the aortic valve. Look at the vertical. Well, there's a mask here. I don't know whether you can see because the lights, uh, overhead lights are blocking the visualization there. So there is a mass on the vertical. Well. 
So this is a patient who had antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So antiphospholipid anti antibody syndrome, the so-called cardiolipin, anticardiolipin syndromes, they may present with DVT or DVT plus pulmonary embolism or they may present with valvular disease. They look like vegetations on the valves, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, aortic valve, more commonly mitral valve, less commonly aortic valve. They may embolize and then produce systemic embolic manifestations. This is a 44 years female who came to us for fibroadenoma breast surgery. She had a general anesthesia. She had surgery. And then soon after extubation following surgery, she had acute pulmonary edema and shock. So she was re-intubated, uh, put on inotropes, and we also uh, put her on IABP at that point in time. All the usual therapies for pulmonary edema and then uh, shock state were given. And echocardiogram was done, ejection fraction was 30%. Look at the echocardiogram. Then uh, after this, we did her coronary angiogram because there are massive ECG changes. The coronary angiogram was normal, completely normal. So that is when uh, we were just, this, uh, this is a patient whom we saw in 1995. 1995. This case we published in Indian Heart Journal. That time this uh, Takoshubo cardiomyopathy description was not often used. First time Takoshubo cardiomyopathy, what is now called as stress cardiomyopathy, that word was first used in 1992. It had not yet come into uh, I mean frequently read cardiology literature. So we call it as a reversible myocardial dysfunction. We published it under the title Reversible Myocardial Dysfunction, one case report in Indian Heart Journal, which was published subsequently in the late 90s. Then we saw many of them. Now we have more than 100 patients with this phenomena called stress cardiomyopathy or Takoshubo cardiomyopathy, which is basically due to either mental stress or physical stress. Commonly, this was originally called as a broken heart syndrome. So stress produces massive catecholamine surge, which leads to myocardial necrosis possibly, which may also lead to uh, coronary vasoconstriction even at the capillary level and produce stunning of the myocardium. And good news about this is, if you manage the acute episode well, they recover completely. That is the good news about this condition. But bad news is it is most frequently missed and very few people think about it. That is the bad news. So the message is keep that in mind. This is a Paget's disease. One of my patients I'm following for the last 20 years. Uh, he has a classical Paget's disease and LV dysfunction and a left bundle branch black and uh, systemic hypertension. The only thing to be remembered is we, do, we don't see that often Pages disease in this country. So far I have seen only half a dozen with cardiovascular manifestations. But out of curiosity I included them. But I would like you to see this patient, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. This is not that unusual. Cirrhosis of the liver may present to us with myocardial dysfunction. So this is a new entity, relatively new entity, described for the first time only 80 years back as cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. The two cirrhosis can also lead to pulmonary arterial hypertension, not only portal hypertension, but pulmonary arterial hypertension may present to you as just pulmonary arterial hypertension. You may not know anything about cirrhosis in that individual. So that is called as portopulmonary hypertension. For the first time we saw these patients in the early 90s when I accumulated a group of eight patients with portopulmonary hypertension. We were wondering what this is because we had never read about it. We were never talked to about it uh, in our 30 years previous career. Then suddenly when we were thinking about it for months to publish, then a report appeared from Cleveland Clinic, United States, a group of eight patients, exactly the same number we had, 
a porto pulmonary hypertension due to cirrhosis. So please do remember, one of the things to be excluded if you have a patient with unexplained pulmonary arterial hypertension is cirrhosis of the liver. That's one. And two, they may present with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy. And three, they may also present with intrapulmonary arteriovenous fistulae, which are not visible on the chest X-ray, but they may produce paradoxical embolism and stroke, TIA or systemic embolism, because of the arteriovenous shunting in the lung. So, cardiovascular manifestations of cirrhosis are not all that uncommon. So remember these three, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, this uh, Ravi should know because this was your patient Ravi. It's related to Dr. Ravi Bhatina. So he was already a proven cirrhosis. He came with heart failure and this is what we found. And this was a cirrhotic cardiomyopathy with uh, portal hypertension and he had esophageal varices, he had bleeding and subsequently a uh, few months or a year later he had hepatorenal syndrome and subsequently passed away. Am I right? Yeah. So you look at the echo, it just looks like any other cardiomyopathy. I don't want to go into the details of why cirrhosis develops into all these things. It is uh, suffice to say that is because of, you know, liver is a gatekeeper. It is a detoxification organ in the body. All the poisons, either chemical, metabolic or whatever, are detoxified in the liver. If the liver is not functioning, they go across the circulation into the lungs, goes into the heart and systemic circulation. That is how they produce damage in the lung blood vessels, produce pulmonary arterial hypertension, produce AV fistula in the lung, systemic embolism, and also myocardial toxicity and cardiomyopathy. That is related to various factors which are not detoxified by the damaged liver. I think this is my last case. There is a doctor, a young doctor, 44, you know, 44 years, he's young to us because I'm 65. So uh, he came to one of my colleagues, EP colleagues, with palpitation. When we did a halter, I will show you the halter, uh, we found that he had a recurrent, non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Okay, an echocardiogram was done. His myocardium reasonably was abnormal and hyperacusenic at places. So we thought there is some scarring of the myocardium. Then we did a PET. I'll show you the PET. Then we made a diagnosis. Then we did a thoracoscopic lymph nodal biopsy. And finally, we came to the diagnosis that this was myocardial tuberculosis. See, we were always taught we ourselves taught our students that tuberculosis does not involve the myocardium, does not involve the endocardium. It involves the pericardium, all right, but not myocardium, not endocardium, not valves, not coronary arteries. But that is not true. That is not true. We have seen tubercular myocardium, not just miliary tuberculosis of the myocardium, but we have seen tubercular uh, caseating masses in the myocardium and we have seen tubercular myocarditis and we also have seen tubercular coronary arteritis okay and we have seen tubercular abscess of the mitral annulus caseous abscess of the mitral annulus so the message here is tuberculosis is so common in the world particularly this part of the world and much more so you know nearly 80 percent of world's tuberculosis is in India so you probably have unrecognized myocardial tuberculosis, which we are not investigating. So look at this echocardiogram. I don't want you to go into the details in any case. Just to show you that there is wall motion abnormality. Then this is the PET CT that was done then look at the lymph nodes. This is the uptake, FDG uptake. This is the place where we picked up the thoracoscopic biopsy, which proved to be tuberculosis. So this is the uh, myocardial PET. Look at this inflammation of the myocardium. 
this is all uptake of the FDZ in the myocardium. This is inflamed and inflammatory myocardium, so which is active inflammation, right? See, so inactive inflammation does not take up FDZ PET. So here we knew that we are dealing with most probably an inflammatory disease. Then we plucked the lymph node from the media stranum, then found that it was a tubercular thing and uh, we put him on anti-tubercular therapy and subsequently we repeated the PET. All that inflammation has disappeared and his myocardium has become normal, his current echocardiogram is normal, his halter is normal and he is asymptomatic. This is his halter, you can see here, non-sustained multiple ventricular arrhythmias. So thank you for your time and patience. So the message which I would like to drive down is cardiologists need to know a lot of internal medicine and internal medicine specialists, internists and other specialties like nephrology, neurology, etc. They need to know some of cardiology at least. Any number of times I saw a pheochromocytoma in neurology ward because they had some schiza, they admit in neurology and treat for epilepsy. Any number of complete heart blocks because they have schiza due to uh, Stokes Adams, they are admitted in neurology and treated as a epilepsy. Okay, and I worked in Chest Hospital for a, a year or so long back in early 80s, and 30% of admissions under the tubercular the department of tuberculosis and chest disease for cardiac patients because they used to have a stamp. Anybody who comes after 2 o'clock, does he have shortness of breath, hemoptysis, chest pain? If any one of the three are present, they will put a stamp there, emergency admission under uh, department of chest disease. So 30% of them used to be cardiovascular diseases. The symptoms are common, you know, all the three are present in both organ diseases. So the point is, all of us need to keep our eyes open and ears open. Uh, the cardiologist should know more of internal medicine and all of you should know at least some of cardiology. So if you know when to suspect a heart disease or a heart involvement, when I know when at least that when I should suspect that this is a generalized systemic disease but has come to me because current manifestation is a cardiac involvement, that's more than enough. That is the message I wanted to carry back. Thank you.